Hi, I'm Ali Patterson and welcome to The Paytech Show. In today's episode, we're going to be learning about the changing payments landscape in South Africa. While the whole African continent seems to be leapfrogging many other markets with its huge mobile phone adoption and lack of legacy infrastructure holding it back, South Africa has a more nuanced payment market. With that in mind, we wanted to learn more about this unique ecosystem by chatting with Abdul Salam Alawi from HPS and Gordon Little and Raj Manaji from FMB, who are one of the leading banks in the country. What's the payments ecosystem like in South Africa? Because on a, on a map, when you look at kind of uh, GDP per capita and such, you'd expect South Africa to be slightly different. So, so how is Africa, uh, South Africa different from the rest of the continent? I think South Africa, from a GDP point of view, from an industry, from and and therefore from the the payment ecosystem, is far ahead from any other other country, and we can see it in the uh, payment methods that are made available to to the to the citizens. It is far ahead. But what we have also noticed is that despite this increase of uh, payment methods of electronic payment of transactions. The cash is also growing. So is it a, 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 a trust issue? Is it a, a financial inclusion issue? Uh, I think it is uh, something between. And I believe that uh, if we want to see a, a, a proper, a positive, a successful financial ex- uh, inclusion, it should not be limited to a, a, a payment method or a payment mean, it has really to include the customers inside a social security system, offering them other financial products like insurance, like health, like uh, savings for the kids to go to university. It's really socially including them because financial inclusion only is, is limited in time. Payments in South Africa, it's quite an interesting uh question i mean if you look at payments in south africa the way we see it uh, and it's a it's sort of representative of south africa in general i mean we have a very sophisticated modern first world payments infrastructure uh, that has actually been globally rated as one of the you know top five uh, you know payments infrastructures in the world uh, through various uh, you know independent surveys as well as you know being a developing country with a uh, with the challenges of uh, you know some elements of our uh, country still operating in the third world, developing world. Uh, also, p- parts of our payments infrastructure that is lagging. So, uh, the challenge for us as banks is we always have to grapple with the fact that we are, in many respects, quite sophisticated and comparable to many developed markets, but also have challenges of developing markets. So, uh, b- both from a uh, you know, a retail client or a business or corporate client, that's always the challenges that we grapple with in South Africa. Uh, Gordon, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that. I think our challenge largely with the payments infrastructure is it, it was, it's, as you noted, Raj, kind of very advanced. I guess our challenge is one of inclusivity. How do we kind of spread that net and, and broaden kind of our ability to include kind of micro payments and, and, and those elements? And you know, clearly we're working hard to try and improve um, you know those those aspects of our, our payment environment, and we face plenty of competition from from the new fintechs, uh, even on our side of the world. I, I always argued that uh, fintech was born in Africa uh, with, with Safaricom a few years ago. I, I, am I right in thinking now that there are more cross-border payments inside the continent of Africa than there are happening outside of it? No, look, I mean, I think uh, Africa is probably similar to many other, you know, sort of broader economic zones is there's a lot of uh, movement of monies between different countries as uh, you know south africa a lot of people working here and sending money back to their families uh, in in neighboring territories uh, you know so uh, that together with the trade activity that runs between the various african countries um, does uh, generate a huge amount of cross-border flow I'm not sure if it's bigger than the, the flows from South Africa to sort of more developed markets like the Europe. Uh, arguably, I think flow is bigger to Europe than into Africa, but I mean, it's something we can check. check. <laughs> customer experience. We've got to talk about customer experience and more specifically the customer interface as it's so critical now. It is that point where the bank is directly interacting with their customer. What can you do at HPS 
to improve the ability of organizations to make the most of their customer interface. So, uh, as as you, as you said, the, the most important thing is the is the user experience and how the, the customer will love to use that product. And I think it's like in anything you like, it has to be simple, it has to be seamless, and it has to be, of course, especially in payment, it has to be secure. So these three components have to be into any user experience uh, responsible team, they have to address these three main aspects. If one of them is missing, it will not simply work. Currently, there's been a lot of talk about payments infrastructure. How has using uh, HPS's power card helped you to deal with the significant changes in payments architecture? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I mean, I mean, basically, from a FNB perspective, you know, we see uh, HPS and its solutions uh, related to power card uh, as being applicable in two parts of our value chain. The one is on the acquiring side. Uh, which Gordon has responsibility for at an executive level, and then also on the issuing side for card issuance, which uh, you know, which is largely driven out of uh, out of out of my responsibilities. And uh, both of these platforms historically has been part of our core banking platform that we implemented in the uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and. Uh, we felt that, uh, you know, as part of our ongoing evolution and modernization of our core banking platforms, uh, we looked to uh, a third party to help us uh, figure out how to, to evolve and modernize our card platforms, both on the issuing and acquiring. And through uh, an extensive process, we landed up with HPS uh, and its power card platforms, for both issuing and acquiring. So it's a key part of our you know, banking platforms and, and one that, uh, you know, we believe is and will continue to play a key role in our strategies uh, in payments. I think, Raj, if I can just, if I can just add, so I think the other side of it was, you know, we've, um, we've come out of a, a long kind of previous investment cycle with our previous vendor. There's a lot of kind of, uh, if you like, home built solutions in that space. And we kind of felt that going with an internationally recognized vendor will give us the ability certainly to improve on a number of the back office functions, which uh, needed to be kind of uh, polished and I guess brought up brought up to, to to speed. We've been very happy with a lot of those gains and certainly having kind of a, a solution that's used more broadly and kind of is interfaced into a, into a number of, of kind of card platforms across the world that you know, we see as kind of helping us quite significantly with uh, efficiency over time. That's been a big, that's certainly a big move forward. I think our own migration as well, you know, we're kind of well through that migration exercise and we can see kind of some of the simplicity that comes with uh, the new architecture. So I think you know, we're very buoyed by kind of the opportunity it creates to simplify certainly a lot of our operational processes as we move forward. Um, just um, following up from that, how did you find the actual migration itself? Uh, what was the, the process like with APS? Uh, so maybe I can take that one, Raj, and you can maybe add on on, on to that so I, I guess we we followed quite a cautious approach we we looked at at migrating some of our smaller simpler kind of uh, merchants first um, and clearly we, we worked on kind of a, a piecemeal or a, a staggered basis so we picked pockets of merchants and migrated them from a customer perspective the migration was largely seamless and kind of many of the smaller merchants would have had no idea that they'd move from kind of one card acquiring platform to another um, at, at uh, over the last six months, we've we've started to focus on some of the more complex vendors, and uh, towards the end of this year, we'll finalise that migration by moving some of the multi multi entity multi lane uh, vendors that or merchants that are still in in the mix. But so far, so good. It's been largely seamless, and if you spoke to our client base, I mean, certainly the service interruption has been absolutely kind of. Uh, kind of uh, clean from our side. So very pleased with the way it's gone. And I think, you know, it augurs well in terms of this approach. Clearly, if we'd gone Big Bang, there'd have been a lot of kind of concern and certainly as a as a development shop that likes to build our own stuff, you know, picking a path where we could gently find our feet has worked well for both the bank and, uh, and the merchants in that particular space. Thanks, Gordon. I mean, maybe just to add from the power card issuing side, I mean, uh, between 
you know, Gordon, myself and the, the teams, we've actually almost taken a different approach where we're not trying to migrate our existing business. We're actually using the platform and the functions and features to actually build out new solutions that we want to, uh, you know, to bring to market that we believe will disrupt and benefit uh, both clients and ourselves from a, you know, market competitiveness point of view and then look to lead with new products and new innovation and then over time you know hopefully the migration will become easier as a result because uh you know in just for context there one of the big challenges on the issue inside is the the world of the physical card and where is that going to evolve to over time you know given the uh the rapid increase in uh you know app uh, app based uh, solutioning you know so uh, the more clients will use their apps uh, to 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 pay for things, whether it's through a virtual card, through one of the pays like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and even our own pay, which is FNB Pay. Uh, we believe the card and all of the historic importance of the card becomes less relevant. So we're actually focusing on driving, uh, you know, more into the virtual space, both for physical and uh, e-commerce spend. And then hopefully the migration of the physical world of cards will become less important and, and while still an important part of the solution, uh, you know, can follow. So it's uh, just an interesting different approach that we're taking to the issuing side of, of the power card rollout. Now, Raj, maybe just to add a comment, I think on the virtual card front, I think what's been quite exciting is to exactly to your point, rather than focusing on kind of fixing or repairing things or enhancing which is going to be in the focus in acquiring this kind of uh, ability to leapfrog has been fantastic and i think i don't know about you Raj, but i've been quite excited by using that virtual card so we were part of an internal kind of test group and it's really quite cool and the fact that you can abstract the card in a virtual sense on the fmb banking app and kind of pivot it see the front and back i think you know kind of really really very good from a, a client experience perspective and I confess, Raj, I've been selling it uh, on some of my client calls. It's a bit of a, it's, 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 it's one of the, it's quite fun to demonstrate. So certainly from my perspective, very excited by what's going on the issuer side as well. And maybe, I guess, for the, for the broader audience, I mean, what's, what's cool is it's not just a retail solution. We've got a lot of interest from small businesses as well. So, yeah, very, very chuffed with what we've achieved on that front. What what does this mean for your customers? Uh, as you mentioned, Gordon, this is also for the, for the SME customers, not just the retail. So what does it mean for, for your customers who now have access to the power card solution in, in South Africa? So I think, you know, historically, we were always somewhat kind of uh, restricted and restrained by kind of our ability to to engage with 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 clients in conjunction with with the software partner. So kind of, we certainly believe that our ability to acquire large clients kind of in partnership with, with the new solution kind of will stand us in good stead. I think the other thing that we're excited about is kind of, you know, when you set up a solution like this, you've got a great opportunity to tidy up things like data and, uh, <clears throat> and some of the service solutions that we have for clients. So we're very upbeat about that. There's still work to do to make sure that the way we abstract those insights to clients is kind of world-class. And we think that that's going to be the key differentiator going forward. Also very excited by kind of our ability to use some of the data sets that come across these hubs uh, to produce better client insights. I think that's going to stand us in, in good stead. And I think the other reality was, you know, to my earlier point, we'd invested a lot in the legacy platform. It really was a time to transform it and make sure that we've got a far more flexible and malleable solution for both the bank and our client set. No, I think, I mean, I think uh, Gordon's uh, positioning is correct. I mean, from uh, to your question around the impact on businesses, I think, you know, one of the challenges we have in South Africa, coming back to our introductory comments is uh, we, we, we sort of have this very formal economy where card acceptance and electronic payment acceptance is, is, is compatible with, uh, you know, most developed countries. But then we have, uh, you know, what we we call sort of the informal economy where there's still a lot of, uh, uh, you know, historically disadvantaged uh, township based economies that are still very cash based. Um, and that's where we believe the solutions on the acquiring side that PowerCard enables as the clearing and settlement platform for acquiring is enables us to be more disruptive in, 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 in enabling uh, 
you know, uh, digital acceptance uh, and actually to formalize that economy, both for, you know, for the country and as well as the, the cost of cash and the risk of cash, uh, which we obviously as, as uh, banks in South Africa, together with uh, government, would like to see reduced reliance on over the, over the years to come. With the culture of payments now moving towards very, very high volume and the need for it to be instant or a period of instant, how critical is it to have that that platform streamlined? Uh, so uh, uh, you, 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 we said it before, and I, I'll, 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 I'll emphasize on and add on 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 this. The the industry is really changing in in, in its form. It's changing in its volume. It's changing in the form of the attacks that are coming uh, from outside, and this means that the business has to be very very agile before when we were talking about the the agility it was more on the technical uh, aspects we were maybe on the team that was running these operations but what we are seeing now is that the business himself has to be more and more agile it means that we need to have more or very fast business model change we need to have operations that could be changed from one day to another. So many things that are uh, to be uh, flexible and the time to market that was before only for a product. The time to market is also today for the operations and how we can deploy them internally. So the agility that will enable this business agility has to be higher and the system needs to be de designed from the very inside as agile, scalable, and being able to change to support this business change. And always the same, if this is going to be at a very high cost, it will just kill any opportunity of business. So this agility in the how to accept, how to run, how to absorb new business models with its cost are extremely uh, important and this today can only be uh, deployed can only be made available if this platform is really natively digital and not being patched to be able to accept a new channel to be accept to do this or that and in hps in power Card, even if we have been in this business for many many years and and a lot of our customers has testified that that when they come to us, they they think that we are between bracket old, but they have seen and they have witnessed that the investment we do in our research and in development and in our innovation is that we have a new platform every uh, several years, every five to six years. It's really a new platform that is brought to the market and not just uh, a makeup on a legacy platform that is uh, growing. Uh, one of the benefits that FNB's had is we've had a real-time banking infrastructure, uh, arguably going back to the 90s. So transactions that operate between uh, clients of Gordon on the business corporate side and the retail clients on, 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 on the, the portfolio that I'm responsible for, to the extent that payments or, or, or credits happen between us, that's, that's always been real-time and real-time value exchange. Uh, often the challenges come when it's moved interbank. Uh, you know, we we do have various forms of interbank uh, uh, real-time payments. I mean, we've had uh, infrastructure in South Africa called RTC, which is real-time clearing, which effectively allows transactions to clear literally in seconds between banks. Um, and you know that we were one of arguably one of the first countries in the world to adopt that payment mechanism, going back arguably 15, 20 years now. Um, the challenge is that we haven't evolved that over the years and, you know, some of the new, more modern uh, real-time payments infrastructure uh, maybe has, you know, has moved ahead of us there. And then obviously the big challenge that, and I mean, I suppose this is where uh, between where CARD and EFT uh, we see as the sort of big thing that we all need to figure out what's the future is that there's this convergence of card-based real-time payments and EFT-based real-time payments. And at the moment, you know, I mean, those rails are arguably developing independently of each other. Um, and both, you know, especially in the interbank space and 
uh, certainly our view is that we need to move to more common capabilities, you know, fraud, uh, disputes, chargebacks, etc. Um, and allow for convergence of rails between card and EFT for real-time payments, which is sort of the big next thing that we as an industry uh, need to get our heads around. Uh, Gordon, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. So, so I think, look, it's, it's an interesting uh, debate. I think kind of the other side is that the service model in South Africa also historically has meant that you know, even kind of where we've got merchants on the other side, we're giving them kind of value kind of by close of business. So historically, you know, some of the delays that you see in other parts of the world between kind of a card swipe and settlement simply aren't, you know, is, hasn't been an issue in the South African context. So people have become used to, I, I guess, high standards of certainty linked particularly to card payments. And part of our challenge going forward is, you know, kind of how do we make sure that people value kind of uh, the, the ability to either push payments to give certainty or, or respect the fact that, you know, the swiping of a card, virtual or actual, you know, has got a different kind of uh, value and, uh, and, and kind of, and conceptually a different fee that gets levied com compared to payments which have less certainty. I think the other side of, of, of the point, and it goes back to what Raj said earlier, is like in many occasions, in many circumstances, we haven't pressed correctly priced for cash. So currently the incentive isn't isn't in the system for people to migrate from, from cash to card. And if you go back probably the last 10 or 12 years, we've worked really hard to try and migrate as much cash to card as we can, but it's an ongoing journey. And as we end up with more kind of formal in and out points for, for cash to link back to card infrastructure, I think that you know, over time, we slowly kind of come to terms with, with those things. I guess the interesting snippet from a South African perspective is the utilization of cash over the last 10 years has not yet declined. So much as we've done all this great work in card, cash continues to, to, to grow as a basis of, of, of settlement. And again, within that context is some of the opportunity for, for us as a bank in the South African space. Absolutely. Just touching on that point around around cash, especially uh, using the, uh, the the U word, unprecedented times. But may, maybe removing removing cash from the system, which might be a positive, but you've still got to make sure people can have access to it. Can you tell me about your work with PowerCard and how that enables you to get, well, really enable people to have access to digital payments? Yeah. No, I think that's. I think that's right, but it's also, we've got work to do to make sure that people are comfortable to use acquiring infrastructure in spaces that cash historically dominated. So part of that is kind of making sure that we've got affordable solutions for smaller informal merchants in, in that space. So that's part of the journey that I guess the banks are, are on. And you know, some of the solutions in that space are like using you know QR code for acquiring and having kind of power card in the back end kind of facilitate some of that that migration. So we, we, we're working hard. We also think that in the acquiring space, um, you know, kind of we, we're going to go away from requiring hard terminals to kind of, you know, software enabled kind of uh, terminals going forward. As a consequence, you know, the need to have a physical device kind of will, will, will disappear and people will be able to use their, their smartphone for acquiring. So we're kind of working hard to try and make sure that acceptance grows as technology moves to allow further inclusivity. One of the other things that I always find is a big killer of innovation is, um, is fear. Um, so how can HPS help banks to tackle fraud? So uh, I think it's, it's one of the, of the risks and of the pain that, that our uh, customers and, and the industry players are, are, are suffering from. And, uh, it is also uh, emphasized by the fact that this industry is evolving so much and so fast. So uh, we, we have moved from very static uh, payment methods or very static transactions to very sophisticated one. And we have been moving from a few years ago, uh, again, uh, attended terminal only and if you if you remember the first unattended terminals were the the, the 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 gas stations and and it's there that the fraud was was very uh, very high at, at that time and when you have a look at what is happening today 
more and more unattended terminals, the more and more independence is given to the payer, to the payee. Merchants are able to take uh, payments on their mobiles. Customers are able to pay on their mobiles. Sometimes we go into uh, uh, invisible payment where nobody knows really if he's paid or, or, or paying. So the whole thing is, is changing. And the, the way the fraud needs to be addressed or the, the, the risk, generally speaking, need to be addressed is also uh, have to follow this trend. And what we have done in, uh, in HPS uh, is that we have enhanced our Power Card Fraud module to be able to address the fraud from a global point of view and not only from a channel point of view. So we have now uh, this Power Card Fraud module that is able to be customer centric, making sure that we can link the usage between this form and this form to make sure that we can protect the customer and also our uh, bank uh, customers. So this is one in one side and we, when we, the mobile first uh, aspect, this mobile first tool or this mobile first strategy is also important because we can empower, we can enable the customer and also the merchant to be able to play a role in this fraud fighting and all this under this power card fraud module that is really an umbrella that will be protecting the business and also the interest of the end customers. What has HBS's platform done to lower fraud to your merchants? So I think you know some of the flexibility comes from the rule sets that are, are kind of available in in the platform, I think you end up with with more transparency, more parameterization, and again against that backdrop, we can also tap into the fraud experience of using kind of a global vendor. So that's where we think the benefits come from. I mean, unfortunately, kind of card fraud through both the merchant as, as well as on the issuer side is a big issue for us in in the South African context. So you know, the implementation of Power Card, I guess, is a further enhancement in terms of the tools that we have to try and prevent fraud. Now, historically, we've had um, we've had challenges with, with um, fraudulent merchants, but we think the controls and the new solution kind of, you know, further help us in that space. And we've also done some really cool work in our own uh, fraud space outside of the, the Power Card platform to make sure we pre-score a lot of merchants so that when they do join us as clients, we've got a kind of our own window of insight as to the nature of that client, which is, Again, I think that in conjunction with the platform stands as in good stead for the future. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's episode of The Paytech Show. You can catch the rest of the HPS payment series on The Paytech Show over at fintechf.com and on YouTube and Vimeo. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.